بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ مائی ڈیئر برادرز اینڈ سسٹرز آئی وانٹیڈ ٹو کریٹ اے ویڈیو کنسیڈرنگ اے لاٹ آف کنورسیشنز آئی بین ہیونگ وتھ پیپل آئی بین ٹاکنگ ٹو مائی فرینڈس مائی کالیگز مینٹی اسٹوڈنٹس آل اوور پر ہیپس بیکاز آف دا نیچر آف دا کنٹینٹ آئی ٹین ٹو کریٹ وی آر ہیونگ مور اینڈ مور کنورسیشنز اباؤٹ دس پر کوشچن دیر ایم آلویز گیٹنگ آسکڈ از Uh, how did I or how do I get closer and closer to the religion in, in my own striving? And that is the question that I wanted to answer. I've created this video to particularly uh, discuss uh, the tips that are helping me in particular in my own experience. What are the uh, little things that I'm doing? Uh, but perhaps in my eyes, I feel that they are very important. what are these tips that are helping me get in, get closer to the deen to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so i wanted to share them with you and by no means i want to at the beginning itself i want to tell all of you that by no means i am perfect or even close to perfection or even close to a one percent of it but these are the things that i'm trying and i'm working on and i'm striving uh, and they have helped me greatly so i wanted to share them with you okay let's get started Uh, the first one is establishing the obligatory prayers with conviction now you know as uh, you know islam and uh, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself has decreed the five obligatory prayers and it is the uh, second pillar of islam salah after um, iman or after the testimony of faith the second pillar of islam is the salah so it is that important in fact There's a hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that says that the difference between a believer and a disbeliever is the obligatory prayer. The disbeliever is someone who does not pray and the believer is someone who prays. So and and you know the story the Isra and the Miraj the journey the night journey that Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam made the salah uh, the prayer is not something to be taken lightly it was decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself and initially it was decreed to be 50 as per my understanding but uh, several locations after prophet moses musa alaihi salam uh, exhorted to our prophet requested that you know your ummah will not be able to do 50 uh, imagine you know 50 compulsory or obligatory prayers uh, several times or about three or four occasions prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he went back and he requested for the number to be a lesson and it became 40 it became 30 it became 10 ultimately it became 5 and after which uh, the prophet despite prophet moses telling him to go back and get it reduced uh, our prophet being the shy person he didn't want to go back uh, again and he just accepted it to be 5 and he brought it and he taught us how to pray so this is extremely important for every muslim uh, this is non negotiable in a sense uh, it paves the way to everything else so the salah actually paves the way to everything else i have my own experience with it i was someone who who was very weak uh, and and at the moment i do try my best and it has helped me greatly and everything i i, I believe that everything started with uh, the conviction to engage and to establish you know the uh, allah subhanahu wa taala he commands in the holy quran establish the prayer so the conviction and the commitment we have toward establishing the prayer because it is the the cleanest the purest form of worship of course everything in life can be worship but it is the purest form of worship so we definitely need to engage with it better the second tip i can share with you is the recitation of the holy quran now you know that the holy quran is in itself and it is the miracle that has been bestowed Uh, the revelation came to prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam who was not a literate person he was not someone who could read or who could you know who could um, write so uh, illiterate the illiterate prophet right ummi we call him so someone who is illiterate would definitely there is no chance um, that he could produce something of this magnitude even in terms of the literature and the language keep aside the the nature of it the content of it the knowledge of it keep aside that even in terms of language this is not something an illiterate person can produce that in itself that is the proof 
one of the fundamental proofs that uh, the Holy Quran is divine and it is divine revelation. So the recitation of the Holy Quran is very important. And I, I remember initially just because I had given up recitation for a long time, I hadn't even touched the book. And what I did was I started initially to engage with it, to start reciting because I had given up, I had forgotten, you know, uh, Tajweed and how to recite. I had forgotten some pronunciation and the Maharaj of the letters. But what I did was I slowly, uh, I just practiced, you know, I, about you give about 10 minutes a day, every day, maybe after your uh, evening prayer or Asher prayer or Maghrib prayer, you give five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Uh, and uh, but you keep it consistent, you know, that there's a uh, prophetic hadith that uh, Allah loves uh, little things, sure, done consistently, rather than huge things that you do once in your life or once a year. Uh, he likes things that you do, even though it may be little, but every day consistently. So if you can give 10 minutes of your time initially, Trust me, it will go a long way because that's what uh, helped me. So initially, I didn't really, because this is also another question that I get asked uh, if I started reading with the uh, meaning. But no, uh, it took me almost about a year before I started to you know, look at the meaning and try to understand it because I had to get into a flow of it. I had to get closer and it is something I feel is permitted. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to permit us so when only we strive, when we give the 10 minutes and we show him that we are committed and we do it consistently, only then he opens the door for us to you know, expand our engagement with it. So it's no uh, simple thing. Uh, it's you know, number two on my list. It's definitely something very grave, very serious. So I would definitely urge you to uh, use that as an opportunity and motivate you to get closer to the book of Allah. Because I'll remind you another hadith is that uh, the best of people, the best of people are those who learn and teach the Holy Quran. These are the best of people. So whenever you see an alim, whenever you see someone who has knowledge of the Quran and who is following it and who is teaching it, uh, these are among the best group of people. Of course, that judgment of how good, how best they are that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we make and uh, will make and uh, we ask him to forgive us. We ask him to take care of us. We ask him to help us in our striving. The third tip I have to share with you is um, understanding the concept of Tawheed, which is uh, translated to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in depth. Now, why I want to highlight this fact is because it is something that I actually did not have a clear understanding of, despite my basic background when I was young of having learned it as a subject, you know, and, and having the basic understanding, I really didn't understand that the true depth, because even if you take the concept of Tawheed, oneness of Allah, there are three categories. There's Tawheed al-Rububiya, uh, Tawheed uh, al-Uluhiya, uh, or Tawheed al-Ibadah, and there's Tawheed al-Asma uh, wa-Sifat, right? So it's uh, oneness in dominion, oneness in decree, uh, and oneness in worship, and the third oneness in names and attributes. So when I started learning and when I actually came across these things, only then I started really understanding what the true essence of the Tawheed means and, and why when we say, and, and that helped me understand the true uh, gravity of the statement, La ilaha illallah, that there is no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because uh, just uttering the testimony and not really having a good grasp of the testimony. Because you see, if you look at paganism and if you look at most religions that have digressed, if you look at Christianity, they have the Trinitarian concept, that three in one concept. If you look at Hinduism, they have from, uh, you know, 10 to 20 to 300. Uh, but if you look at all of this, the, the Trinitarian idea has the Godhead. So they do have the concept of this one major power, but they've, they've kind of, you know, broke it down into three to make it a, a more absorbable thing and, and something that benefits the clergy and benefited the people who invented these ideas. But when you really look at the preaching of uh, Isa alayhi salam, Jesus, peace be upon him, he preached oneness, he preached Tawhid. Uh, when you look at Moses, he preached Tawhid, oneness. This is the, the message that it's one. That's where we differ when you look at Hinduism and when you really look at the Vedic scripts, the original scripts, uh, there are clear indications 
that it was one of the I, I truly believe that the Veda, the original Vedas are one form of the books that were sent to uh, some prophet uh, before our time, long before our time by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because there are clear evidences that, that are almost identical to some of the um, lines I think uh, Dr. Zakir Nayak has been an incredible personality who has shed a lot of light on the actual Vedic scripts and how they uh, kind of stress on the oneness, on the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So at the beginning, you know, you, you try to learn about it. At the beginning, if you, if you come across it, it will be learning Tawheed in, in the three breakdowns. And under uh, Tawheed al-Rububiya and Tawheed al-Ibada, you really don't have big problems. You, it's very easy to absorb the fact that Allah's uh, dominion is absolute, that he is the one who uh, who uh, manages everything. Uh, he is the one who decides everything. And uh, the second ibadah is that, the, that he is the one who uh, deserves worship. Only one. You don't worship anyone. And, and the concept of worship gets clarified when you learn that. What exactly is worship? Because uh, in a simple sense, even eating can be worship. Even drinking, even, you know, something we, we believe to be, you know, really simple, right? Writing, anything, sleeping can be worship uh, to the prostration that we do. And the third, the names and attributes. There's a lot to learn there from the Asma'ul Husna to the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for me, it was a big eye opener. And I've barely scratched the surface, but the surface itself is amazing and it clarifies to you a lot about who uh, actually our creator, uh, the Almighty, is. I think that is the third tip I have to share with you. <coughs> Excuse me. The fourth uh, is very important. Uh, perhaps uh, this was something that really shed light because, you see, I was... Uh, <laughs> Capitalism and economy and earning and you know all of that had gotten to me but always in my mind I was worried because uh, I was always questioning myself even when I was working for companies and I was looking at what I was doing and the impact it was having on society it came to a point where at times I really questioned of whether I was doing something morally correct and then always we we tend to think you know where is this moral line who who teaches us what is the right and what is the wrong and that's how Islam comes into play and then the communicator of that message, the messenger himself, is, is the embodiment because we need someone human to have shown us the way. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never, ever, he's, he's too uh, big, too powerful, too absolute uh, to, you know, come by earth, uh, subhanallah. So we need to understand the importance of the messenger. And I only started, I had a few books, uh, some of my old, uh, some of my mom's and dad's old books. Uh, they were just lying around. I don't know why for 30 years I didn't read them. But I started reading them. I came across a few books of the Sira, and I bought a few. I, I think I can recommend uh, books like The Sealed Nectar. Um, uh, I think, uh, I don't remember the exact name, uh, the English name. Uh, then uh, The Life of Muhammad uh, by Haikal, uh, the Egyptian uh, writer. Uh, so there are many books like that, uh, which are really good. Uh, Ghazali's book on the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that was a good start. Because when you really read uh, the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you realize the, the, the incredible personality. You realize who he is. And the more you read... And the more you understand the little details of how he dealt with different things and his life and how he how everything played out in a certain manner and how he faced those hardships and his uh, you know gentleness and his quality and his character and his humility you know a man who commanded the Arabian Peninsula has nothing to his name when he was uh, when he when he passed away. So this, this incredible personality, we need to really understand who the Prophet was, which is why I'm sure Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has paved the way for the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be the most well-documented biography in the world. There is no biography of any man that has been that authentically verified and documented in the world. So if you want to learn about Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you need not go that far. There's that much literature and out of which 
there's been plenty of attempts to you know uh, scandalize his personality there's been plenty of attempts to you know create uh, uh, phobias and create lies of his personality but when one cuts through all that noise and you will come across all that noise but when you cut through and you really get into the crux of the matter and you really start learning about our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam you realize this is this is the man he is the man we should be following so learning the seerah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was a great opportunity for me uh, it's something i always like to go back to uh, this is the life of muhammad which i always have around with me uh, but there are other books uh, that you can definitely access uh, if you want uh, i can add a list maybe i can add a list of uh, books that i've read in the description inshallah taala uh, the fifth tip is reading memorizing uh, several important and sahi uh, authentic sahi or you know serious and uh, reliable hadith about creed and trying to be upon them so uh, what uh, let me clarify this the way i understand uh, creed is arabic in arabic we call it aqida is uh, what we believe it's it's creed because you know even in islam even in among muslims there's sectarianism right there's so many factions this division uh, there's you know all kinds of people um, from the madhabs you know which has created division uh, the the hanbali the hanafi the maliki and the shafi you have those madhabs then you have you know the sunni and the shiite and the asharis and you know you have all these different uh, sectarianisms why because there are sufis etc so i have i have no judgment i have a, a particular understanding a reasonable understanding i i hope alhamdulillah is the correct understanding of the creed but one should strive to learn the creed if our creed is wrong uh, we tend to introduce innovations we tend to introduce bidha uh, into our discussions right now the one of the best places to correct your creed is using hadith using authentic verified hadith because then you have you don't have a lot of noise and you can start from scratch so you you pick a few books like sahi uh, bukhari uh, sahi uh, muslim uh, you know an nasai you pick you pick a few books uh, and extract creed related faith related belief related sahi uh, and reliable hadith and you work with maybe 10 15 20 now for example let me tell you uh, omens right omens a lot of people believe omens and and because people tend to believe in omens uh, it's a huge business right from little ornaments to you know some uh, people believe this time is not a time you should go out of your house and this time is not a time you should enter your house and if you step out and you see a black cat then it's a bad omen you know so omens are haram in islam because we say la haula wala quwwata illa billah that there is no power no might except allah subhanahu wa taala so whenever we we tend to associate an omen if we learn the creed of it right now when i learned the creed i realized omens no way so even you know among ourselves when we do things we tend to think little things like oh if i you know maybe if i uh, type this this way or you know <laughs> if uh, i used to have like if i uh, send the emails after a certain time you know this works out back in the day when i was working so i had all these notions unnecessarily uh, this color you know seems like you know i like this color it always works out so these are all few time so the moment you correct your creed what happens the benefit i got was a lot of the unnecessary thoughts a lot of things that i tend to depend upon actually got negated everything became so simple la haula wala quwwata illa billah life became actually very simple another good example in creed is astrology right astrology is haram in islam magic is haram in islam so you won't learn about the intensity and the seriousness of these matters now for example if you take something like magic we do believe in magic you know musa alai salam he used the staff and allah gave him uh, the the power to make his staff a snake in front of the magicians which were who were sitting in the council of pharaoh so that is magic and magic was introduced by two allah sent two malaikas two angels harut and marut the babylonian 
uh, civilization and that is where we know even ex outside the islamic uh, knowledge we know that magic began during that civilization so we know it to be true but it is haram and we don't believe it we don't depend upon it so it is the learning of the creed that allows us and helps us really follow the right path so one has to strive i feel that one has to strive toward uh, correcting one's faith correcting uh, the creed of uh, how one follows islam so if you can correct that if you can use knowledge it's a huge uh, plus you have a lot of answers to anybody to anyone who comes and challenges you about islam and anybody who wants to talk about islam you have a lot of answers because you've learned the creed you know what is in the religion and you know what is not in the religion so that is very important you know what you believe so alhamdulillah i've again scratched the surface but i want to implore all of my brothers and sisters please uh, start at some point hadith is a good place but there are separate books on aqida now if you take uh, universities that offer islamic degrees for example even the university of madina in the first year the main subject one of the main subject is aqida they teach it that's one of the most important subjects so it is very important and uh, another example i can give you is if you look at the prophetic commission the time duration during which the prophet was commissioned he was commissioned to be the prophet when he was 40 years old so from 40 to about 53 years old um, he was in mecca he was operating in mecca facing so many troubles now if you look at the meccan revelations of the quran the revelations that came to the Prophet ﷺ when he was in Mecca, they were focused on correcting the creed. That's the thing. It, it, it corrected so many things because there was a lot of pagan elements, a lot of problems in, in with the oneness of Allah, which is one of the important elements of creed, what you believe about Allah. You know, now, for example, if someone asks, where is Allah? So we have a fundamental understanding that Allah is above all. Literally, he is above all. He is, you, you literally look up. Uh, he is above, he is the most high. al Adim. it's one of his names also. So he is at the highest point of everything above the Arsh. Now, some people who have problems with creed, some people have an understanding that Allah is in everything. So Allah is in the food you eat. You know, he's mixed in everything. He's in the najis that you have. He's in the garbage. So this is not possible. This is not viable. The, the Holy Quran, his names, attributes, everything very clearly clarifies where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. So unless we learn the creed, this is a problem. We are unable to have correct faith and we are unable to face others as well and even do da'wah. Okay. This brings me to the sixth point. Using the month of Ramadan a great opportunity now personally for me it was very helpful i remember perhaps my inclination to the religion uh, remained uh, in some way because every ramadan with my friends along with my friends uh, it was a great opportunity to always come back however far we had deviated however far we had forgotten the ritual the forgotten uh, our duty toward allah there's always ramadan to bring us back and you know you always tend to think about going to the mosque uh, you you know you have fajr you have the sahar and then you have the maghrib which you know almost all the time you're breaking your fast in the masjid so you have your obligatory prayers most of them are getting done and you're not uh, eating so you have a lot of time to think about why you're not eating and then you realize you're doing a compulsory act one of the main pillars of islam after zakah it's the fourth pillar so when you have all of this i, I feel uh, for example especially after i started to you know try and learn and understand the deen more and more the times of ramadan that month those months were very very useful and i feel that as muslims we don't uh, get the maximum benefit of it we don't reap the benefit you know uh, the quran itself says that the ramadan is the the outcome of ramadan uh, the test of Ramadan is that when you come out of it, your taqwa, your consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to have increased than when you began your Ramadan. So now you had Ramadan a few months ago. I, we all had. Now if we find ourselves today in a place where our consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was lesser than when, we be, uh, when it was before Ramadan, 
this is a problem my dear friends because we haven't reaped the benefit so that is why we tend to get closer and it is a great opportunity to use you can do everything that you want to do in terms of getting connected to the religion from all the points i said about reciting the quran um, going to the masjid your obligatory prayers anything that you miss you know the additional voluntary prayers etc you can add all of that into your system during ramadan it's a great opportunity and uh, i was someone uh, i aspire to use it as much as i can and we should i believe uh, work harder at it as well so it was a big uh, tip uh, that helped me okay the seventh one is the contemplating upon the signs of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so when i say signs everything is a sign i want to clarify that but uh, just for an example you know you take the trees rain the sky the sun and the moon the day and the night time in itself gravity planets motion etc everything right the the physics of things the the objectivity of the and the nature of things the logic of things the way the mechanism of things the planets you know how they operate because it's so perfect right everything's perfect if we know that if if the the distance between the moon and the earth was shifted by a few hundred kilometers everything will collapse we know already uh, how uh, the the tides are managed by the nearness and the farness of the moon with the earth so imagine if it goes beyond those lengths what will happen right the, the entire gravitational mechanism of how the earth is managed how the earth's oceans are managed is going to crumble it's all perfect the perfection of creation is a good uh, thing to ponder about because that points you to the perfection of and the knowledge of the creator and having creation um, for example i always say that for me the proof that hell exists uh, a place where the fire is a thousand times uh, a million times hotter than the fire we know is the existence of the sun when i look at the sun i always remember the the temperature of the sun which is something unbearable is like one hundredth of hell but we do know that something as hot as that exists then definitely that is proof that there can be things and locations and places that are hotter than that and you know the size of the sun right you think how many people have lived on earth and hell is a place that is going to accommodate billions and billions and billions of people so i think about the size and then i look at the sun and i know it's um, several hundred times bigger than earth so <laughs> accommodating people on something a place like that is not difficult at all this is these are things that i've contemplated and i fear a lot and i think we all should uh, in the holy quran many a times allah is exhorting allah is inviting allah is warning through the messenger look at the signs look at the signs oh believers oh oh men look at the signs contemplate upon the signs haven't you seen don't you see the bird flying don't you see the rain that we sent down don't you see the see the wind blowing don't you see the mountains that we fixed don't you see how the day merges into the night and how the night merges back into the day so that you can sleep in the night and work during the day don't you see these signs he's asking so whenever i come across an ayah like that i've always thought seriously don't you see the tree that is you know sprouting from the ground nothing which is a a good evidence for the resurrection that we are going to have because something that was dead comes back alive so when we die it is evidence for me that we will come back alive that life can be given to us so contemplation upon that and further contemplation upon uh, the hereafter which is the akhira and the day of judgment which is qiyama is uh, very important they have helped me a lot uh, and i feel i'm not doing enough of it uh, but we always have to have limits uh, but, but i don't know where the limit is i feel my limit i haven't reached it yet i don't think of it enough i i feel like i need to strive more but everyone i believe is this is a good place to start in terms of reminding yourself who you are what your place is and where the creator is who he is and what his place is subhanallah the eighth tip 
is going to the congregational prayer at the masjid as much as you can. So this was a very important thing. Uh, there were times when for me, logistically, I felt it was not easy, but then I shifted um, when I was working in, in one of the companies where I was working back in Colombo, uh, it was closer to the masjid. So suddenly I found myself in a situation where the masjid was like you know, five minutes walking distance, so I realized, okay, there's an opportunity and I started to go slowly. I feel not as much, not all the five times, but I tried to do as much as I can. And I, and I feel, I told you, my point in one was the congregational, the obligatory prayers. But now I'm saying the obligatory prayers in the congregation, that is powerful. Just praying as how it should be prayed. You know, there's a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, where he says, if it were not for the women and the children, I would go and burn the houses of those who do not pray, who do not pray the congregational prayer. He has said it. So it, it meant that he is not going to burn them because there are children and women, but it means how serious the congregational prayer is. So if we have been blessed in some way or form, to have the opportunity to be in a place where the congregational prayer is happening and we can be there. And if we are not taking that chance, one, we have to remember the prophet is thinking that our house deserves to be burned because we don't have the patience and the striving and the commitment to go and uh, pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to pray our creator in en mosque. Right, in the congregation. So if we, I mean, I feel if for any of you who has been blessed with the masjid close to you in your proximity, you have a duty, a fundamental duty to go and pray. You and I, we both have, and I'm not doing enough of it. I don't know how it is. So Alhamdulillah, if you're doing, mashallah, I want to congratulate you. I want you to be the best of those who do the congregational prayer. But I ask you to pray for me, to make the dua, to, for me to do as much as I can, to, for me to do more of it as much as I can. But it was very helpful as a tip. The ninth uh, was, is uh, periodically reflecting on the benefit of Islam, its knowledge and practices. Now, this is very important because, see, humans, what happens is, when we do something and it works, we like it more, right? We like it more, we tend to do it more. Now, what, for me, what happened was, I was like not even very close to the deen. And then slowly, one by one, step by step, when I started doing this, Alhamdulillah, I started seeing the benefits. I started to see how it was having an effect on my character, how it was having an effect on my finances how it was having an effect on my relationship with the people I love, with my family, with my friends, how it was having an impact on the students, how it was having an impact on my career, on the way I was working. So my striving, uh, slowly, periodically, when I tend to think about it, I see the benefits. I, I, for example, I saw how uh, when I started go, trying to go to the congregational prayer in the masjid as much as I can, especially when I was back in Colombo, I started feeling how, because I would go during the breaks of my work, right, of my office. So decisions that I would make in a hasty manner, words I would have spoken to, you know, a, a colleague or a teammate or a uh, supervisor harshly or impatiently. Uh, I don't do it because I have to go to the masjid. I take the time. So during my walk, uh, during the prayer, you know, during the time we ask for supplications, you're thinking about all that and it all boils down. And it all, when you go to the masjid, you're remembered uh, who you are, what your place is, because you'd be praying the congregational prayer and the same company, the, C, the CEO or the CFO might be praying next to you. So you know where you stand, you know the real place of humans. So you're cool when you go back, you're, you're in a very state, uh, high level of calmness you have inside you. So then you're able to deal with your life better. So it's, it's incredible. It's incredible. Uh, for example, the Fajr prayer, the morning prayer, um, when, you, when you pray it, and especially when you go to the mosque and you pray it, and you, you have properly followed it in a way that you, know, you don't sleep at 2 o'clock, you watch movies or whatever, 
uh, until two, three, and then you sleep for one and a half hours, and then you tell yourself, oh, I'm striving and I go. That's not the way to do it. There's a, there's a proper discipline to it. So you do it, you have no idea the benefit that you can reap off the morning. It has said that for the Muslim, the morning was made uh, with barakah. So Muslims have the highest amount of barakah in the morning. If a Muslim is sleeping in the morning, not getting his work done, this is a, a futile thing. This is a, actually a wasteful thing. So Alhamdulillah, you know, we, we have to understand how many things are connected, how everything is so well connected, so well tuned for us. And if we don't access it, if we don't use it, what's the point? So that's why I want to invite all of you to periodically, when you, when you actually practice, that's the thing. When you see the benefit of it, you realize, oh, because I prayed this happened, because I learned that Quranic ayah, this happened. You know, I, I dealt with this in a different way because I uh, learned about the seerah of the Prophet and I learned how, you know, when he was going to Tawaf, uh, Taif, uh, how he dealt with those people and how those people actually slandered him and hit him with stone and pelted and, you know, did so many horrendous things and how he dealt with that. When the angels of the mountains came and asked him, shall I destroy this village? And he said, no, perhaps someday uh, they will uh, bow down to Allah. And he was patient and he was forgiving. So when you learn that, you're inspired to forgive. And you realize because of that, whenever an occasion comes, when someone in your life, your family member, your friend, someone wrongs you, and you have an opportunity to forgive, you remember the seerah of the Prophet and you do forgive. And then you reap the benefit of it in, in unimaginable ways because things come to you. Allah gives, Allah rewards it. So it's, it's crazy how uh, those things are connected. So when you see the benefit, you, tend, you want to do more. That is Alhamdulillah, the way of Islam. And uh, there's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in Sahih Bukhari, where he said, if someone strives to perfect his religion, if someone who is following his religion is striving to perfect it, to do better at it, Allah will reward his good deeds from 10 times to 700 times and upwards. 10 times to 700 times and upwards. Imagine the reward. Imagine. And, and keeping away from sin is another major aspect. Finally, the last tip, the 10th tip, is adding zikr to your daily life for the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, of course, the best form of zikr is the Holy Quran. That is the best form of zikr. So if we, you know, it's not merely saying La ilaha illallah or Subhanallah or Alhamdulillah or La ilaha illallah huwa dahu la sharika lahu lahu al mulk wa lahu al hamdu wa huwa la kulli shayin qadir or you know Hasbi Allah la ilaha illallah huwa alayhi tawakkal tu wa huwa rabbul arsh al azim or you know uh, there are so many supplications um, you know from you know, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa kina azab nar to you know all kinds of supplications Rabbi vidni ilma all kinds from the Quran from the Sunnah even something as simple as Awwadu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim and the salam assalamu alaykum wa alaykum assalam then jazakallah barakallah you know you have tabarakallah you have all these words because they remind Allah to you. So it is all forms of dhikr. And the best form is reading the Quran. Every letter is a good deed. Every letter is a good deed. It's not even every word. Every letter is a good deed. So adding dhikr to your life, perhaps a little five minutes in the morning, five minutes in the evening, it made a great change. To me, it calmed me down, it helped me a lot, and it increased my uh, consciousness of God, alhamdulillah, and I asked him to help me more, but I, I feel I'm not doing enough at all, uh, but I feel, you know, another way of, uh, because we do all of this to increase taqwa, right, increase consciousness of the creator, and another way is the voluntary prayers, because I've only uh, mentioned the obligatory prayers and the congregational version of it, because that's the first step to salah. And then if you, if you get it right, you can add the voluntary prayers. You can add witr, you can add the hajjat, you can add all kinds of prayers. And when you learn the prayer, you realize when you go through the Sahih Bukhari, when you go through the book of prayer, you realize for someone like me, what I realized was I knew nothing about prayer. I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know what to pray. I didn't know the positions, the perfection of it I could attain. I didn't know how, what 
Allah meant when he said establish the prayer. I didn't know what it meant. So only when we learn, when we learn from the ulama, when we learn from the books, when we learn from the hadith, we slowly start realizing the gravity of things. So Alhamdulillah, these are the uh, 10 tips uh, that I can share with you at this point. Um, that these are tips that are helping me currently. These are helping me as of now, things that I'm working on, I'm trying to strive toward. Uh, so that uh, my, I, I inshallah, I ask dua, so that my uh, closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, the book of Allah and the deen of Allah uh, is uh, stronger. And I hope that these tips help you. I hope that, that you make good use of it if you choose to watch it. I really, I sincerely wish the best uh, to you, my brother, my sister. Uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said that the true Muslim, that the real Muslim is the one who wishes for his brother what he wishes for himself. So if I, I want something for myself and I don't want it for you, that is not Islam. So whatever I wish for myself, I truly, sincerely, I ask Allah to keep my intentions pure and sincere to maintain the yaqeen and I ask for yourself as well. Uh, I ask he forgive us. I ask uh, he forgive whatever mistakes I've done here. Um, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin Nabi al-Ummi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa sallim. Subhanallah. Uh, Subhanallah. Walhamdulillah. Wa la ilaha illallah. Wa allahu akbar. Uh, ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Wa nastaghfiruka. Wa natubu ilaik. Assalamu alaikum.